Okay, everybody, welcome. We're going to uh, get started. I hope everybody had a fantastic week. And um, everybody should remember to uh, take a look at our YouTube channel, Breslov Thornhill, and to check out Rabbi Yaakov Klein at lpitorah.org, I think. And uh, all the other amazing Torah resources that we have. Okay. We have a few people in person and a few people online, so uh, let's get started. We are starting today with chapter 13 in the book, Story of Our Lives, by Rabbi Yaakov Klein, which gives over the story from Rabbi Nachman, the lost princess. We're going to dedicate this shir today as a refuah shlema for a very, very special lady in our community who was recently diagnosed with uh, a very serious illness and is starting treatment for this illness. She should have a Rafu Shlema very, very, very quickly. Her name is Liat Gittel Bas Chana. This shir should be Li'ilu Inishma, no, sorry, should be for Rafu Shlema, for Liat Gittel Bas Chana. So let's begin. Okay, so we are now, just to remember where we're at in the story, we the, the Viceroy made the big mistake of, after the year of longing, of eating the apple and falling asleep for a couple of years. And he woke up and the princess told him that you gotta start again. So we're taking it from that place now. So let's read the text from chapter 13, and then we'll get into the ideas. By the way, Shmuley wishes he could be here today. He's uh, got uh, something for his children's school today. And so, it's just me today. We'll have to do our best. Okay. <laughs> All right. It says like this, So the princess says to the viceroy, and so too, go again and choose for yourself a place. And also, Stay there for a whole year, just like before. But this time, on the last day, you'll be permitted to eat. But you cannot sleep. And don't drink wine, because in order that so you shouldn't sleep. Because the main thing is sleep is the sleep. That's the main thing we're trying to avoid. So he went and did this. And on the last day, he was walking back there again. And he saw a flowing spring. And it was red in appearance, this spring. And it smelled like wine. It smelled of wine. And so he asked his servant, Do you see that this spring here, it's proper that it should have, it should be water. But the, the appearance of it is red, and the smell is of wine. So he went, and he had a taste of the, he tasted from the spring. Venafal Vayashan Miyad Kamasham Shanim. And he fell down and he slept right away for years, many years. Ad Shivim Shana. Until he slept for 70 years. And that's the quote for this week's piece, chapter 13. So, as we've been doing, we'll go through the sections that Rabbi Yaakov writes about. And we'll bring in some of our own ideas to it as well. Okay, so the first point, the first point, super, super duper important. And I'll say that it's something that, that we talk about a lot already in all of all of our classes together. But it's brought out in a new way today with some fantastic stuff. So let's see. So she said to him, right? She said to him, She said, go again and choose for yourself a place. So the point is here that she didn't say, go back to that place that you chose and do the same thing over again. 
The princess tells the viceroy, now you have to choose a new place. What's the new place all about? Why a new place? Why can't he just stay where he was? So the main thing over here is a very important idea. It comes out in a few ways. Is that after we experience a fall, after we experience a yarida, we, we, you know, we say many times already, there's no such thing as a failure by us. No such thing as a failure. Only a place to learn from and from that place to move forward. Right? Only a learning experience. So when we have that failure, that quote-unquote failure, when we have a yarida, we fall. We must, from that place, become something new. We can't be the person we were before. It must be that we've learned something, and now I'm ready to become the next version of me. Right, Richie? I'm going to be Richie 2.0. That's what I'm going to be next. I have to change. I have to become something else. Right? Because I'm taking that experience and using it for the future. Because we have to know that if that happened to us, if we had that Yerida, that it's Min HaShemayim. It's supposed to happen to me. I had to experience that. And it's going to be a main theme of this week's lesson. He said, if I experience something like that, a fall, a Yerida, or I invol- I'm involved in some type of wrongdoing, an Avera, a sin, whatever it is, that that is happening to me for a purpose. Even my sin is happening for a purpose, and we'll be very careful with that as we move on. We're never allowed to, on purpose, do an Avera or do, do a sin, right? But when it happens, it means something. We have to take that and move forward with it. So he brings a beautiful verse over here. Before we get to that, I want to add something over here. There's a famous question that many people have asked. And that is like this. How is it that we can pray to Hashem? How can we daven and ask Hashem for something? How can we do it? It's stupid. In, in the Havamina. <laughs> Why? Hashem is good. Hashem, we, we, we have this philosophy that Hashem is good and He wants what's best for me. Right? So, and he knows what's best for me. I don't always know what's best for me. Right? Sometimes something comes to me and I think, this is, this is for me. This is what I need. And I see, a few weeks later, a few months later, whoa, was I wrong. That was not meant for me. Right? So, why should I ask? <laughs> he knows better than me what I'm supposed to have. So, what am I asking for? F- famous question. You with me on that? So, one of the answers is, is that the purpose of tefillah, of davening, of praying to Hashem, is that after each one of those prayers that I that, that, that I say, I I thought about myself, and you know the one of the understandings of the root word for for tefillah, for lehit palel, is that the lashon of of pe lamed lamed means to judge, and lehit palel means to sort of judge oneself. So I'm looking at myself, I'm figuring myself out during during my davening, during my prayers. And in figuring out what's important to me, I'm trying to understand by asking, what do I really want? Right? Do I really need that uh, fancy car? Or do I really need, you know, to, I don't know, what other superfluous thing, super superficial kind of thing that I need? Do I really need that? And I come to a deeper understanding of myself. The idea is, is that when I finish that prayer, I should be a different person. I should be a new person. So then we can answer the question. If it was good for me, wouldn't Hashem have already given it to me? He's good. He wants what's best for me. So if the thing that I'm asking for was good for me, He would have already given it to me. The answer is, is the person before, the, before I daven, before I prayed, it wasn't good for that person. But now that I spoke to Hashem and I prayed and I looked at myself and I changed, I became a new person, ah, oh, maybe now it's good for that person. So now I can ask. I became something different. I'm a new person, right? Similar to what we're saying over here. After we experience a yerida, a, fail in, a, a, a situation of failure, or so-called failure in my life, right? I got to take, take what happened to me there and use it to become a new person. Use that experience. Use everything that happened to me there and, and become something new and move on to a next level, 2.0, right? So he brings a beautiful... A beautiful um, Pasuk here that is a song. Also, Kichu imachem dvarim veshuvu el Hashem. We say this in the Chodesh Elul, leading up to Rosh Hashanah, the month of Tshuva. Take 
with you words, devarim, veshuvu el Hashem, and return to Hashem. Meaning, when you're doing tshuva, when you're returning to Hashem, bring words with you. So the conventional understanding of this is that when I'm doing tshuva, what do I bring with me? I bring my words of Torah and tefillah and uh, vidui, and, and my sort of confession. I take the words that I use to talk to Hashem, and the words that I use to pull out the negativity from myself, veshuvu el Hashem, and go towards Hashem. Right, but everybody who knows anything about the Hebrew language knows that the word for the word davar means word, but the word davar also means thing. Right? So kechu imachem davarim. Another way of understanding it is you gotta take things with you. When you're doing tshuva, you gotta bring stuff with you. You gotta take things with you. What do you take? You take those things that you needed to learn, those experiences that you had that are going to be an ingredient to the new you, you got to bring those with you. And only if I take those with me and now I move on with a new perspective and a new existence, now I can go on to the next, to the next, the next level of my own existence. Right? So take things with you. He brings a story, a beautiful story, of, uh, that, that Reb Nassim was walking with some of his Talmidim past the house that just burned down. And they saw the owner of the house was there searching through the rubble, looking for pieces of wood that he can use to rebuild his house with. And Reb Nassim said to his students right there and then, he said, you see what this person is doing? That's the right thing to do. What did he say? For indeed, this is the proper response to destruction. Top of page 219. One must search within the rubble to find the good points that will enable him to carry on. Look within the rubble of ourselves to find the good points. What do we have to take from that? That's going to help me to move forward. Right? So the beautiful, a beautiful uh, Pasuk that we saw this week in one of the, one of Reb Nassim's things on the Parsha, where basically translated, the Pasuk says, I will build an altar, I'll build a Mizbeach from the pieces of my broken heart. What does that mean? It means when I face a Yerida and I, I get broken down a little bit. So it's from that situation, from that being broken down, that I take those pieces, and from that, I can build something. That I can build an altar to, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I can build my next level of existence. So taking it to a whole new level. Now this is where we have to be careful. Remember last, uh, last week, I said there's certain things that you can't, you can't repeat, or you can't cut out without the whole, the whole thing, right? So from here is where the whole thing has to be heard, because it's dangerous stuff if you don't hear it right. He quotes the Sfas Emes. Sfas Emes says like this, Teshuvah rectifies sin. In truth, the vitality of sin is the existence of the potentiality for tshuva, which is enhanced by the existence of sin. It is this factor which provides sin with its life force. What's he saying? Why is sin allowed to exist in the world? Why does the Kodesh Baruch Hu want us to be able to do something wrong? Right? I don't like the word sin, but it's the best word I got at the moment. <laughs> right? Why does He allow us to do this? Why should this thing exist even? So He's saying, everything that, that's in existence has a life force. It has to exist somehow. Everything in, exist- in the world has, ex- has a life force. Sin itself has a life force. What is it that sustains sin? Why is it brought into the world? Why is it allowed to exist? Right? The answer is, is because it's the potential of growth and tshuva. It's the potential to take that experience and move to a higher level within the sin. It's the, that's what gives the sin itself its ability to exist. That's what give it, gives it its, its, its vitality. That's why it's even possible for it to be there. Do you hear this? It's totally wild. So what we have to be careful is, is we have to be careful to say that it doesn't mean that I go out and I say, you know what I'm going to do tonight? I want to really get to a high level, so I'm going to do a lot of Averas. I'm going to go tonight, you know, out to a club, bar, and I'm going to, I don't know, do whatever people do. <laughs> and through that, I'm going to have, I'm going to go take that Yerida, and then I'm going to go a very high Aliyah. I'm going to go way, 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 way up, Right? Because it doesn't work like that. As he brings in one of the footnotes over here, I think it's on the next page, that, it, that, 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 that an, an Avera 
learning from our mistakes only works if it's really a mistake. It just doesn't work otherwise. It's not in the system. I'm not, if I do it on purpose, it's not going to work. I'm never, never, ever allowed to think of myself as doing something wrong on purpose, doing an Avera on purpose. We don't do that. Plain and simple. But we do need to know, and it is tremendous chizik and, and a way to, to understand our lives, that when we do fall into those traps and we do do things that we're not proud of, that from that place, we're going to be able to take that experience and use it as a way to grow higher and higher. He quotes Rav Cook. The last time of this quote, he says, it comes to turn all sins into merits. From all mistakes, it derives lofty lessons. From all descents, awesome elevation. This is the whole concept of tshuva. That from down there, from, from, from that place, down low, I can go very, very high. And it's only when I experience such a yerida, only when I fall down, am I able to take that and move upward. Right? You know, so I hope everybody heard that. The importance of, we, 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 we never do such a thing on purpose. We never do a sin on purpose. But it's a very big chizik for us to know that whenever we experience this type of, this type of fall, that it's going to take us somewhere, high, somewhere higher. And it's only if we say, if I take those things with me, and if at the end I choose for myself a new place, I'm a new person. And how am I a new person? From the new perspective I developed, from the new lessons that I learned, from the humility that I derived, from that experience that I just had. I'm a new person. That's the first lesson. Everybody with me? Can I get some thumbs up? All right. <laughs> okay. The next section we're moving on to now on page 220 is don't fall asleep. So it's very clear from this section of the story that we're learning today that the main focus is sleep. She, the princess now tells the viceroy, this time around, you can eat. Just make sure that you don't fall asleep. And also, don't drink wine so you won't fall asleep. The main thing is sleep. Sleep is the main thing we're talking about over here. This is a very, very tremendous, serious lesson that we're going to see in the next two sections. So what does it mean to be asleep? You know, we've talked about it in a few of these classes. Well, let's look at page 221, a little bit into the first paragraph, and let's read from Rabbi Yaakov's words. What does it mean to be asleep? When one is far from Hashem and has difficulty allowing his awareness of Hashem's imminence to serve as the deciding factor in his personal choices, he is asleep in a spiritual sense. It's a powerful, powerful statement. That means when I don't have in front of my mind the imminence of Hashem. The imminence of Hashem means that, that Hashem is everywhere in everything and behind everything that happens to me. If I don't have that at the front of my mind, I'm asleep. If I don't have that in the front of my mind, I'm just a robot. Right? Someone reminded me this week that I used to say a few years ago this, uh, this, this, this funny thing that I called RSS which is religious robot syndrome, right? <laughs> you could even be a religious person, but you're just going through the motions. You're just living your life the way you always live your life. And you're not making your decisions or thinking on a moment-to-moment -moment basis about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? Like you've heard me say many times, it's very possible for a person to be sitting in a yeshiva, learning Talmud, for hours and hours and hours, and never once think about Hashem. Very possible. Right? And it's very possible to wake up in the morning and flick on the phone and right away look and hear the news about what happened at the Oscars last night. And all of a sudden, have that invade your mind for the whole rest of the day. I'm driving to uh, Niagara on the Lake today to where the vineyard is, and I'm listening to the news. And, and this is, this is like, like every 10 minutes, we're talking about that one celebrity slapped another celebrity. The whole world is talking about this. Don't even waste your drama on stage. All, all day, all afternoon, the whole world is talking about this, right? If we're sucked into that, instead of thinking about where is my life going? What, what good should I be doing today? 
what are the good things that I can do? If that's where, if that's where I'm at, then I'm a robot. I'm a robot. I'm just reacting to the system. Right? I'm just reacting to the system. And if I'm reacting to the system, I'm just a robot. That's what, it, that, that's what it means to be asleep. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're from, if you're Shomer Shabbos. It doesn't matter if you're not. It doesn't matter what color your hat is, if it's fur or if it's not. Whatever, whoever you are, there's a way that you can be asleep. Right? This is what it means. So he says a little farther, clarity into his mission in this world and the importance of his every action obscured, he wanders around the arenas of daily life like one who sleepwalks, externally functioning, but internally inert, totally asleep. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next section. But before we do, we're going to talk a little bit about wine. So the princess tells, tells the viceroy, sleep is the most important thing. You can't sleep. Therefore, do not drink wine. On that last day, do not drink wine. So we're going to talk a little bit about wine and, uh, and how it's uh, the power of wine. And it, it's a little bit intense and um, it touches a subject that's a little bit uh, sometimes touchy. But let's speak about it. So Reb Nassim explains in very serious depth the, a lot of these concepts in Hilchas Yayin Nesach in Likuti Halachas. But he says like this. So just to make sure for anyone who doesn't know there's non-kosher wine right and then there's kosher wine but even kosher wine it cannot be if it's if it's poured or even handled by someone not Jewish it becomes not kosher you can't drink it anymore right some people hold even if it's looked at by someone who's not Jewish you can't use it for making Kiddush. Even kosher wine. So there's a thing called Yayin Mavushal. If the wine has been, has been cooked, right, then it doesn't fall under this prohibition. So you'll see many wines out there, are, they have a, a, a word on it that says Mavushal. That means that it's been cooked or pasteurized. And when it's like this, then it can be handled, served by, by anybody. Okay, now here's another an, another to it that um, can sometimes be very touchy. I just want everybody to know that that, that we, we should understand only when it's opened. Only when it's opened, yeah. But there's, a, there's another aspect that can be very strong here. Now, now check this out. But when you hear the whole explanation, hopefully it'll make sense. That wine that's not mavushal, that's not cooked, it can't even be poured by a Jew who is not observant. Not, not religious. Such is the extent of this prohibition. So, let me explain it a little bit, so hopefully we can understand. Wine, for the Jewish people, is very, very important. Wine was used in the temple, in the base of Mikdash, for our divine service. Everybody knows we use wine every Friday night. We make Kiddush with wine, right? The way we sanctify our holidays, we have the power to say, I'm now sanctifying the day of Shabbos, right? Even before the time of Shabbos, I can do it a little bit early, and by me taking my Kiddush cup and saying Kiddush with wine, I can change the day from mundane to holy. Every holiday we make Kiddush. Every wedding, the Sheva Brachas are said, the, the, the Birchas, uh, Erison are said over a, over a cup of wine. The Sheva Brachas are said over a, cup of, over a cup of wine. Every single bris milah, where a baby Jewish boy is brought into the covenant of Avram Avinu, is said with wine. Wine is a holy, holy, important aspect in Judaism. And it may surprise people to know that in Halacha, it's, like, it's very strong and very clear that we are not supposed to get drunk. Jews are not supposed to get drunk, right? And it's hard to see that many places nowadays. Purim, of course, being the exception. Where Purim, we have to get drunk. And there's a whole reason for that, which we're not talking about right now. right? But wine is very holy and very important. Wine for us is supposed to be always Bikidusha, always with total holiness. 
And so, it has to be guarded when there is a temple and there was idol worship going on, right? We, 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 weren't, we weren't allowed to use wine that anyone else touched who wasn't part of that holiness. Why? Because if they use it for idol worship, of what is Zorah, you can't bring that into the temple, right? And so, that's the way that the laws were set forward. And those laws continue to exist today because we don't make wine for the purpose of just drinking for fun. All of our wine is meant to be consumed with holiness. So it all falls under these ideas. So, so where does it come from? What's the deeper ideas behind why someone who's not even not Jewish, someone who's not attached to the holiness of, of, of Hashem, cannot handle the wine. What's the difference? So listen to this. And Rasan explains that if you take the word for wine in Hebrew, yayin, right? What, what's the gematria of yayin? So nun is 50, and yud and each yud is 10. It's the gematria is 70. The gematria of wine is 70. And one of the deep reasons why the gematria of wine is 70 is because wine has two very powerful has a tremendous power. But this power can go one of two ways. It can take us down the, down the path, the negative path of the 70 nations. Now when we say the 70 nations, that means all, all the nations of the world. We're not looking at nice people that we know today <laughs> and saying they're idolatrous, uh, murderous, rapers. Blah, blah, blah. We're not talking about individuals that we know today. We're talking about powers that were put into the world and especially in the times way back when when we had a base of Mikdash when the world when, when our whole existence of the Jewish people was focused on holiness and and the rest of the world was in a totally different different space not attached to Kedusha not attached to holiness whatsoever right and and it can take us to very negative places spiritually now let's remove the spiritual aspect of it we know, even physically, even just in our own lives, if we don't know it for, our, for ourselves, for sure we know it, it's happened to someone, that drinking too much wine in not the right way can take us to a very bad place. And I'm sure almost everybody has had a bad experience with drinking too much, right? It can mamish take us to the worst place. And, and on top of that, there can be addiction, there can be all kinds of terrible things, but it can lead us to terrible situations of anger and fights and, you know, real, real problems between men and women, like very serious, terrible things can happen, right? This is the one pull that wine can have. It can take us into that world, into that world of the opposite of holiness, right? Or it can take us to the other side of 70, the other side of 70 is the Shivim Panim Shal Torah. It's the 70 faces of the Torah. It can bring us to the total illumination of the holiness of Torah. Right? And, and it can be, a, it can be a, a way that our mind can be expanded, our consciousness can be expanded just to the right extent that we can bring in a whole new light and we can reveal new lights and new Torah. Right? But it's very, very important that we, that we know how that works and where that line is. Because the line is, how am I drinking it? In what situation am I drinking it? And how much of it am I drinking? So Rabbi Nachman says very clearly in, uh, in one of the Torahs, I don't remember which Torah it is, that it's very important that a person knows themselves and knows how much wine they can drink to get to a place of, of happiness and of clarity and expanded consciousness. And, that, and where is that line that's going to take me to a negative place? Right? And, and if we're not good at that, just hold back. So you'll see, even though Rabbi Nachman, this is, this, is what, this is what Rabbi Nachman said, the way that many Breslovers in the world take this and the way that they use it is that they just never touch wine whatsoever. They never touch alcohol, period, ever. Right? Which is okay. That's the way some people do it. Not the way I do it, but it's the way some people do it, right? So wine can take us the other way. Going down that other side 
going into Olam Haze, going into the world in this way, is leading me to be totally spiritually asleep. Totally spiritually asleep. That's what wine can do. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next section, and we're going to see how this all plays out. Okay, so, so what happened over here? This is one of my favorite, he, he, kind of, he brings up a term here. Everybody with me on the wine thing? Yeah? He brings up a term here that is one of the, he, uh, Rack of Klein sometimes creates these little sound bites that are, that are really awesome. This one here is very good. So he says like this, the Satan's deception. So he's, he's sitting there for a whole year, again, and every day he's focusing, he's building his, his Ratzon, his desire. He's, he's thinking about how he's going to reveal the princess, how he's going to free the princess. And he's building his kisufim and his longing and his desire and the whole, and he's, he's fasting and right, and he's doing this whole thing. And he's preparing and it's the last day again. And the last day comes. And he's, he says, okay, I can eat. I'm going to eat a little bit, but no wine and no sleeping. And he starts walking purposefully, right? He prepared a whole year for this, again, for the second time. And he's walking on the path from where he is straight to the palace to free the princess. And what happens? He says, hey, what's that over there? <laughs> is that a spring? Wait a minute, is that a red spring? That's interesting, a red spring. It smells like wine. What is that? And he drinks from the spring, right? So what's going on here? Once again, I feel like it's insane what just happened. Totally crazy. So Rabbi Klein says over here that it's like this. The situation is that he saw something, and he saw something that is permitted to him. He saw that, oh, that's a spring. And he saw something fascinating, something that drew his curiosity drew his intellectual curiosity to it. And, and because of that, and he said, he didn't, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing, but his interest was, drew, was drawn out of his mission. His interest was drawn away from his path, literally. And he saw this and he said, well, it can't be. This is very unusual. Like you got a spring coming from the ground, it should be water, am I right? He asked his servant. And the servant, remember, is the intellect. So he thought intellectually, it, it, it should be water. What's going on here? Oh, but it's red. It can't be. It can't be wine. It smells like wine. Ah, it can't be. It can't be wine. And and through that curiosity, he said, like he said over here, he simply must get a closer look. So he goes over to check it out and to see what it is. He's drawn in to it. And when he goes there, he tastes it. And from there is his total downfall. Right. So I'm going to read from the bottom of page 222 over here, um, the last paragraph. He says like this, This strategy is a favorite with the Yitzhahara, and one that he commonly employs. So Yaakov Klein calls this, before we get to that, he calls it the fascinating permitted. The Yitzhahara clothes the forbidden in the fascinating permitted. The fascinating permitted. So it's like this, the strategy, this strategy is a favorite with the Yitzhahara and one that he commonly employs. So often, the Yitzhahara clothes the forbidden in the fascinating permitted, convincing us that the innocent curiosity drawing us to a story, food, experience, or website negates any chance of the story being Lashon Hara, the food being less than kosher, the experience being improper, and the website being inappropriate. So often, seemingly innocuous curiosity serves as the doorway to the lowest places. This is the sly deception of the Yitzhahara, who, as Rabbi Nachman writes, clothes himself in that which is permitted, sometimes even convincing us that what he wills us to do is a mitzvah. Sometimes we see things in the world, and those things are so interesting. The world can be so interesting. Right? And nowadays, oh my gosh, we have a test in this like no one had in previous generations. There's so much information. There's so much ability to just dive into to every aspect of the world, every aspect of existence. And I can see 
things that, that, that are that, wow, that's so interesting. What is that all about? I want to learn more. I want to see more. I want to get more involved with that because there's, it's, 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 there's nothing non-kosher. There's nothing, there's, not, there's no Lashon Hora going around here, for example, right? There's no immoral relations happening over here. There's nothing actually wrong over here. What does the Yitzhahara do by doing this? It pulls us in to focusing a whole swath of our life energy, of our goals, of our thought process, of our intellect, of our emotions, everything into this thing that I'm being pulled into. It becomes a whole section of my life. Through that whole section of my life, I'm being pulled somewhere totally off my path. Kodesh Baruch Hu put me here for a mission. He wants me to do things and He wants me to bring light into the world. He wants me to learn. He wants me to do mitzvahs. He wants me to be kind and He wants me to do all these things. But all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm pulled down something that's taking all of my time, all of my brain power away from my mission. Right? It's very, very serious. So, so we see it can be small and innocuous like, you know, Sometimes I suffer from this, I'll be perfectly honest. My wife gets really annoyed when I do this. But sometimes, something will come up in conversation, and I'll be like, oh, what does that mean? Or, what is that? What's the first thing I always like to do? Oh yeah, I gotta know what that means. Pull out Google. I gotta figure out, I gotta know what that means. <laughs> right? Or if something, how does this work? Oh, I don't know, how does that work? Right? Google it! Figure it out! How does that work? Right? So it's gonna be something totally useless that I'm never gonna need to know in my life. Right? <laughs> so sometimes it's small and innocuous, but sometimes it can get very, very big. And it can take up a whole, a whole, a, the whole entity of a person. Sometimes it could be... Now, now, you have to understand, I'm not saying that it's not good for people to have a hobby or, 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 or interests or a job. Right? How easy is it to become a robot in our job? To become totally disassociated with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in our job, working. Not thinking about Hashem, right? It's very, it's very easy in all these things. But there's a way to live my life when I'm not asleep and I'm awake. So, you know, depending on, on, on what a person does for a living, you can find yourself in, in business. And, you know, there's at least one person on the group here who's uh, in real estate, right? So, and uh, the person I'm thinking about right now is a holy person. So, could be this person is making real estate deals. And before, before he makes a deal, before he's trying to make a deal, he stops and says to him. He stops and talks to Hashem for a few minutes. Okay, Hashem, I, I really want to make this deal happen. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to take the money I make from it and I'm going to you know, feed my family and I'm going to take care of my, you know, my wife and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, and I'm thinking about what am I doing in the world? Why am I here? Not just, ah, I'm going to make this sale because I want to have another sale. I want to pad my bank account. I want to, I want to get, the, I want to show people how great of a salesman I am. Right? There's a different way of existence where I'm not totally asleep all the time. So, this is a question we have to ask ourselves. How are we living in this world? Are we totally grasped by Olam Hazah, by this world, by the Yitzhahara, so that I'm going through my whole day never once thinking about what's my mission? Why did Hashem put me here? What's my, what's, what's my contribution? Right? You know, as I'm, as I'm going through the day and something happens, what's my choice? Am I making my choice Right now, based on Hakadosh Baruch Hu, based on what my what my role is, what my mission is in the world, or am I making my choice at best without even thinking about anything? Right. At worst, I'm being pulled by curiosity, by just interest. Sometimes, by people start pulling me in, and I start <laughs> finding myself in in bad relationships with, with difficult people and who knows what's going to happen. Right? It could, get, it could get very sketchy. Very scary. 
So it's a very, very, very important concept. And, and it has to be very nuanced because, you know, sometimes it can scare us off also. So I, I know that Rabbi Yaakov once said in a shir, it might be in the book somewhere also, but he once said in a shir that he asked, I believe it was Rabbi Yaakov Meir Shechter. Rabbi Yaakov Meir Shechter is, could be the biggest tzaddik in the world right now. Tremendous, tremendous, big tzaddik. And, um, and so he was asked the question, you know, like, what, what's with the world? Why is all this stuff here for me? Why is there all the internet and the movies and the, you know, the, if you're a man, why, what's with the women? What's with this? What's with the cars? And what's with, what, what, why is this all here? Right? It's a distraction. Right? So Richie just said it's a distraction. So Yaakov's answer was, it's here simply to be ignored. Simply to be ignored. <laughs> so, Sometimes we're not ready to hear those words. And we have to be, depending on our level, always very, very, very important to know. We have to know where we're at. And we have to make little steps in our growth. We can't take too, on too much at once. We can't give up every connection we have to the world. <laughs> right? And not only that, we have to live in the world. And we have to meet people. And we have to, we have to meet new people. And we have to... Haskell Zayans, who's on the group right now, he was... Uh, Showing us a quote today from uh, from um, from the uh, the Shara B'tachan of the Chavos Lavavos said that you know what it's not enough that a Jew does Torah and mitzvahs their whole life that won't get you into Gan Eden you also have to enlighten other Jews you have to show people you have to give people some light you have to help people out right bring people up with you and if you don't do that you're not going to get in. Meaning, you're not... What does that mean? It's not about getting in or getting out. It means you're not accomplishing your mission. You're not doing what Hashem put you in the world for if you're not also lighting up other people. Right? So we have to exist with other people. We have to meet new people. And we have to meet people who have different thoughts than us and everything. But the question is, and the thing we have to know, is that there's a very important, strong line we have to draw. And that is, when am I being drawn in to something that, I sh that is too much? When am I being drawn to something that is taking my focus, taking my energy to such an extent that I'm falling off my mission? I'm falling off my path. Right? It could even be a good thing. It could be a very good thing. Or you know? Even meant is a good intention. Yeah. It could be good, good intentions. It could be a good thing. It could be, it could be a positive thing. You know, you could, you could, you could decide that you're going you're gonna to be, uh, you know, the example that people like to use of a good deed, helping an old lady across the street. You're going to say, you know what? Helping old ladies across the street is a good thing to do. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a whole business of uh, hiring old lady across the street helpers. And, and we'll make depots in each city. And we'll and and we'll and we'll and we'll we'll do all these you know we'll we'll yeah it'll there'll be a certain price the government will come in and pay us because it's really helping old ladies across the street and I'm gonna make this whole thing and I'm gonna spend all my time on it and it's old my thing is gonna be old ladies across the street that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna build a whole gigantic empire of old lady across the street helpers right it's fantastic and we're hiring helping old ladies across the street is a good thing right very good thing to do good intentions. Right? But maybe that's not what Hashem wants you to do. Maybe there's something more important. Maybe your path is more nuanced than that, is more broad than that. There's a lot of things to do. There's a lot of Torah. There's a lot of mitzvahs. There's a lot of people to help, a lot of people to light up, and a lot of stuff to learn. Right? And maybe if I put too much of my emphasis on this old lady across the street business, it's going to take me off my path. You hear what, you hear what I'm saying? It's a little bit difficult. So, you know, the way I think of this is the, 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 the line that comes to my mind is that we can get lost in Olam Hazah. We can get lost in this world. Totally lost. And you know what happens when we, get lot, when we get pulled into this world and we start to just focus? It can be even such a good thing as starting a family. And a couple gets married and they're working on their jobs and then they got to buy a house and they have children and 
And so their whole life is paying for the house and, and taking care of the children and going grocery shopping and buying clothes for the children and taking a vacation and, you know, getting the education funds for the children and saving money for retirement and the whole thing, right? right? And all of a sudden, 70 years have passed. 70 years have passed. You slept for 70 years. All of a sudden, we've slept for 70 years. And then we wake up and we say, wow, where am I? Why? Where am I? Why was I? Why am I here? What have I been doing my whole life? This is where we can find ourselves, lost in Olam Hazah, totally asleep. There's, um, there's a famous line from, from Rabbi Nachman in, in one of his Torahs, and it's uh, made into a song, first by Rabbi Yosef Karduner, and redone and very nicely also by, um, by Barry Weber. Um, and it's uh, Hastara, Betoy Hastara. It means, Bafilu, Behastara, Shebetoy Hastara. Hastara means a concealment. It means when Hashem is concealed from me. When I'm living my life, and I don't, I don't see Hashem. This is like this robotic existence, right? But there's one thing that's really scary. And it's the hastara shebetoy hastara. It's the concealment within a concealment. So what does that mean? People think that it means a concealment within a concealment is I'm really, Hashem's really hidden. That's not what it means. It means that I have a concealment. Hashem is hidden from me. I don't see Hashem. And then the fact that I'm in a concealment is concealed from me. I don't even realize that Hashem is not with me. I don't even realize that I'm not living my life with purpose because I've fallen into such a level of concealment. I don't even see that I'm gone, right? And this too can be a situation. This is why the Viceroy slept here for 70 years because it's really possible that if I don't find my line of where I get pulled into this world with my curiosity, with, what did he call it? The fascinating permitted. If I don't draw that line, I can get pulled in, and once I get pulled in, I can get pulled more in. And I can get, keep getting deeper and deeper into this until I can wake up 70 years later. Wow. Scary and powerful. <sighs> yeah. So, it's interesting, it comes out in the end, just to, to, to get to the very end over here. He says that... Um, he says over here, it's like this. This time, this is by the way on page 224 in the last section, a few lines in. This time, giving up on his ability to free the princess, he forgets about her entirely. Traumatized by a devastating downfall caused by innocent curiosity, the tzaddik within feels that he will never again be able to free the holy fire of youth and conquer the Jew's being. If everything in the world represents an obstacle to serving God, how can he possibly move forward? It's also very difficult. We can't, we have to know, we have to take these lessons and we have to really put them to heart. This is also what this chapter means about not being a robot, right? And not being asleep. We have to remember, there's a reason why we learned this amazing, amazing Torah from Rabbi Nachman. We have to always remember that these things that are happening to me, these challenges and difficulties, they're not things that are, that are saying that I'm a bad person. They're not Hashem trying to push me away. It's not that I'm all alone. It's the, it's the total opposite. It's that from these things, I'm going to grow. From these things, I'm going to become a stronger person. From these things, I'm going to become a more connected person. They're going to, they're going to make me bigger and bigger. You saw this beautiful, uh, awesome quote he brings over here from Thomas Edison, right? This is the best one. We've had a few of these from sports, sports quotes before, right? This is by far the best one. Listen to this, page 219. Um, second last paragraph upon finally succeeding to invent a functioning light bulb after 1,000 failed attempts Thomas Edison was asked by a news reporter how did it feel to make a thousand mistakes thinking for a moment Edison responded I didn't make a thousand mistakes inventing the light bulb was simply a 1,000 step process right how awesome is that meaning He's looking in retrospect, obviously. He probably didn't feel so great during all those thousand mistakes, right? 
But, but looking back, and at least to put to our minds, but to put to our hearts, to always try to remember these ideas, that all of those steps, they're just steps in the process of, of reaching my, my own personal gula, my own personal redemption, the, 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 the real revealing of my true self. Right? But it's scary, and these things can really happen. It's, it's mamash, a, a very difficult thing. So he finishes off the last sentence. Indeed, the viceroy no longer makes it back to the orderly palace of evil. This time, the lost princess will need to come to him. So, we talked about just the one last point here, and we'll, we'll finish up. We talked about a few times that um, in the beginning, right, so the viceroy goes on the journey. He takes the, takes the, the reins, and he goes on the journey. He goes to find the princess. Right? And we, we're looking at that time at the princess kind of waking up in the earlier chapters. But now, we see that the viceroy has such a fall. And we see that this is sometimes what happens to us. Right? Is that, is that it, it doesn't, it's not an, our intellect, our own personal intellect, our own search is not going to take us down the path that we're supposed to, we're supposed to be on. Why? Because we're totally asleep. Our whole life is being totally asleep. So what happens? The princess has to come to us. Something happens that wakes us up. I experience something in my life that causes me to maybe shed some tears, maybe go through a hard time, maybe hear the right words from a few different people, and all of a sudden, I wake up. So I know there's a number of people here who, who, who at a certain point in their life, woke up in a certain extent, even maybe if you were born in a religious family certain point in your life, you woke up a little bit. Something happened, an event happened that knocked us down and caused us to look. So this is what happened to the vice right here. He slept almost his whole life. And in the end, he woke up. You're going to say to me, Rabbi, isn't this a Breslov shear? What are you getting so down and depressed for and negative and sleeping your whole life and the world is so difficult and terrible? It's exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. Right? Rabbi Nachman is teaching us this specifically to tell us Ein shum klal. there's no despair, there's no giving up. It's to, that we have to always know that Hashem put us here for a purpose. We have a reason to be here. We have a path. Hashem gave us our, our soul, our chelik alakami mal, our peace of godliness that only we can reveal. And when we reveal it, it shines the most tremendous, amazing light into the world. And only we can do it. That's our mission. And we have the ability to do it. And every time we face a setback, what did he teach us in this chapter? It's not a setback. Yeah. It's just an opportunity to learn from that experience and to take those, those building blocks from the destruction and use them to build an even more amazing structure, to build myself up even, even better, to take the pieces of my broken heart and make a Mizbeach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, make an altar to Hashem. Right? I just got to be careful. And I have to be prepared. There's going to be things that are going to try to put me to sleep. Things in the world are going to draw my curiosity, draw my talents, draw me into different places. And I got to know that. Why? Because Hashem put me here for a tremendous mission and I can do it and He wants me to do it. And I have power and I have amazing light to give. Right? So yeah, it's dangerous and it's scary, but nothing to worry about. <laughs> I just got to keep on the right path and I got to follow Rabbi Nachman's advice and I'm going to be okay. And I'm going to make it through. And the mission will reveal itself. And the mission will reveal itself. Well, that's a nice, that's a nice one, Richie. Richie says, and the mission will reveal itself. I, I think I agree with you. If I, if, I, if, I, if I follow the advice, and I keep on this path, and I do what I got to do, things are going to be revealed as I go through it. Rabbi Nachman calls them simanim baderech, signs along the road that are going to come up, and, and I'm going to see things. They're going to lead me on, on the right path. So, chas shalom, that we should ever ever have any type of despair, negativity, or yish. Right? Rabbi Nachman is telling us, you're on the path, and you're doing it. Just be careful. This is what's going to happen. It's giving us some notice and helping us out on our path. So, if we're, if we're, you know, it's very hard to hear when we're in the middle of a real, deep, difficult situation. Right? Yeah, I heard something so bad today that I can't even share it. It's, it's, it's so terrible. But, People are in really, really bad situations. Very difficult things happen. Oh, I saw some stuff. Very, 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 very painful situations. And 
and and from those places it's it's maybe sometimes not possible to hear this we can't go to those someone in that situation necessarily and say what's wrong with you are you talking about you're, you're in a urethra right now don't you know soon you're going to start to come out of that urethra it's going to be great so stop being sad no we don't do that in that situation that's a time when you when you give your hand to someone and you try to walk together with them through their pain and you give them some hugs and you give them some love and some support and, and just try to help them along in their difficult time. Later on, you can talk about that. But Rabbi Nachman gives us this to prepare us for that. So when we find ourselves in those difficult situations, we can already be ready, we can experience, and when we go through it a few times, we can build up our emunah, build up our ability to be on the right path and to be able to connect to Hashem all the time and to be able to see the opposite of being asleep which what did he say? Do you remember this guys? It's an awesome statement we'll finish with this what does it mean to be asleep? He said when one is far from Hashem and has difficulty allowing his awareness of Hashem's imminence to serve as the deciding factor in his personal choices he's asleep Uh uh-uh we're going to remember and we're going to know where we are and we're going to see clearly that Hashem is with me. He's putting me. I see. He's putting me right in this difficult place. I'm going to emir Hashem, learn what I have to learn here, understand what I have to understand about myself, and I'm going to take those pieces and build the next building, move on to the next level. Always with simcha, always with hoida, always thanking Hashem for everything that happens to me. Every moment of everything that happens to me. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you for the good times, and thank you for the better times. Right? Thank you for all this, every, everything. And when I get into this mindset, I can get through these times and I can go onward and onward and onward and in, in Mirza Hashem, find the princess and free the princess. Not really. Okay. Who would like to make a, a suggestion, a comment, a question, anything? Yeah, Sima. Can't hear you. Wait, this might be my fault. Hold on. One second. Okay, good. Can you say again? Okay, I don't think it's oh, it's necessarily bad to be asleep and to be in Astara because Rabbi Nachman also also said there is no Yerush Ba'olam. And even if you do like Chuba and you awake a day before you die, uh, you win Olam Abba. So I mean, this is also um, like. Um, like a way like not to be too depressed about being in the hastana because you can always do tshuva even the day before you die 100 percent. so there's no use no use know? right exactly 100 well, percent great great uh great um addition sima meaning in all those places we have to know that we're, we're there for a purpose and it's going to help us somehow we can never give up we can never feel negative about our situation yeah yeah Anyone else? Going once? Going twice? Anybody? People in person? No? Personally. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, have a super amazing week. Thank you and very much. And Mir Hashem, we'll see you all next Monday. Have a great, great Thank week. You. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.